Have you ever spent any time around sheep? If you have or you've studied sheep at all, you know that sheep are very peculiar animals. I mean, there are just certain species that kind of make me scratch my head and go, seriously, God? You ever thought about those uh, creations that, that, that kind of fall into the seriously God category? Like love bugs, for instance. <laughs> I mean, love bugs, what's the purpose of love bugs? They, they attempt to, to fly into your car, to mess up your paint job if you don't wipe them off on time. I mean, they're these little insects that connect together and just kind of fly headlong into their own death. I mean, they, for me, seriously fall into the seriously God category. Now, there's an urban myth that says that love bugs were actually created at the University of Florida. This, of course, is untrue. No good UF scientists work their salt would ever create such a thing. However, it is highly possible that they were created at Florida State University. <laughs> what about the Jugbill platypus? I mean, that's a big, that falls into the seriously God category, right? This, this duck billed, beaver tailed, web footed, like half mammal, half amphibian kind of creature. Uh, it's one of the only mammals in the world that still lays eggs. It's one of the only mammals in the world that carries venom. Actually, the males inject venom through their, their hind foot. I mean, look at this guy. Seriously? But, but sheep really fall into that category as well. And if you know anything about sheep, they're not the brightest creatures in the world. They have such a powerful uh, fear instinct that if they become startled enough, they will literally die on the spot. They have such a strong herd instinct that if they are isolated from the flock in any way for a long period of time, they die of isolation and loneliness. I mean, sheep, uh, they have great sensory systems. They have great eyesight. They can see 360 degrees. They can recognize the voice of their shepherd, uh, the, the face of their shepherd among any other faces. But it doesn't do them a whole lot of good. I mean, sheep are the epitome of what it means to be prey. They have no inherent defense mechanisms. In the evolutionary scheme of things, I mean, sheep don't make a whole lot of sense. Now, they have great auditory senses. They can uh, understand and discern the voice of their shepherd from any other voice. But sheep are one of the only species that are entirely dependent on human beings. They have to be groomed. They have to have their wool cut off or they die of heat exhaustion. They have to be fed. They have to be watered. They have to be led to uh, pasture. They have to be protected from predators. I mean, in the evolutionary scheme of things, sheep just don't make a whole lot of sense. Wolves, on the other hand, wolves make sense. I mean, wolves are at the top of the food chain. Wolves are predators that prey upon animals like, you guessed it, sheep. I mean, wolves have profound uh, senses. They can smell their prey from miles away. They have eyesight. They can see in light and darkness. They can hunt in packs like skilled assault teams and hunt down their prey. Or they can hunt in isolation. They can survive in any kind of environment, hot or cold. Uh, wolves are fast. They can run for miles and miles. They have razor sharp uh, claws and teeth. Wolves are agile and dexterous and tough. In the evolutionary scheme of things, wolves just really make sense. Can I get an amen? Now, maybe there's some species out there that look at human beings, and we fall into the seriously God category for them, right? They're looking at humans like, seriously God? And you want them to rule and reign over everything? You know, wolves, they make a lot of sense. If you put a sheep up against a wolf, the wolf is going to win 100 times out of 100, hands down, that's it. But yet, when Jesus talks about his followers, when he speaks of them figuratively, metaphorically, from many different angles and many different texts, he talks about his disciples as sheep, and that he himself is the shepherd. Now, shepherds have a long legacy in human history. It's not a very extravagant or glamorous one. In fact, shepherds are really on the bottom of the totem pole of the social strata. Shepherds, in best case scenario, were usually hired servants. They were people that were paid to look at sheep up all day. In some cases, shepherds were the slaves of the ancient world that were uh, enslaved to watch over the flocks of others. But yet Jesus refers to himself as a shepherd in us as his sheep. 
See, in Jesus, we find a new kind of shepherd. In Jesus, we see the face of God and the nature of God face to face. And we see the kind of relationship that God wants to share with His people in this shepherd and sheep relationship. Jesus comes and plants a community of new creation right here in the middle of the old one. Jesus comes and plants this colony of sheep in a valley of wolves. And by all outward appearances, the community doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It's one of those seriously God kind of situations. But it's that very community that points to a God that's making all things new. It's that very community that's pointing to a God in which new creation has begun. Ronnie, can we turn the air down a little bit? I see folks like shivering and putting on sweaters and stuff. Well, Y'all want to down there? Let's lift up the Word of God together and pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your Word. It is a light unto our path. It's a mirror that shows us who we are. It's a revelation that shows us who you are. We pray, O oh God, that this would not simply be a time of religious routine or another church service, but we come with an anticipation and an expectation that we would encounter you. We pray, O oh God, that you would cause these words to burst forth from their ink cage and to live and dance in us in an incarnate way. We pray that we would not simply be hearers of the word, but doers of the word also. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You know, David was a good king. I mean, in the scheme of the kings of the world, David's up there. For the nation of Israel, David is the greatest king that ever was. I mean, aside from the fact that he was a lover and a fighter and a poet and a brilliant military strategist and somebody who uh, wrote psalms, David did some things that no one since David's been able to replicate. David united the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah. He brought a time of prosperity to the people of the promised land that's been unequal since him. Uh, David was a pretty good king. David had some humble beginnings, though, too. If you think about it, uh, remember Saul was uh, the first king of Israel, and Saul didn't do a very good job. It was never God's intention that there should be kings. It was never God's intention that one human being should rule over others. It was always God's desire that he be a living king, that was the living king of his people. But the people come to God and say, we want a king. Put a king over us like all the other nations. And so they get Saul. And of course, whenever you put somebody on a pedestal, uh, when the honeymoon is over, when they fall off the pedestal, usually the fall is pretty great. Can I get an amen? So if Saul's kind of a train wreck and uh, God sends Samuel to handpick the next king of Israel and he goes down to the house of Jesse and Jesse starts to parade all, the, all of his sons in front of Samuel. And one by one, the sons pass by. And these are just big, kingly-looking guys. They look like kings and walk like kings and talk like kings. And so Samuel is saying, that surely is the next king of Israel. That one right there, he's going to be the next one. And one after another, God says, no, no, Samuel. You see, you're looking at the outward appearance. But God looks at the heart. Can I get an amen? He said, that's not my next king. My next king is the little boy out in the field, the shepherd that's tending the flock. And so Samuel goes out to King David, anoints him with oil. He becomes the next king, and he becomes a pretty good king. We could all agree on that. I get an amen. But the reason I think that David was such a good king, a man after God's own heart, the text tells us, and he too has his own fall and his own struggles, as we know. But David understood that he was just a sheep. David understood that the Lord was his shepherd, that he shall not be in want, that the Lord makes us to lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside still waters. He restored our soul. He leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, yea, though we live in this valley of wolves, we will fear no evil. For God is with us, our rod and our staff. He protects us. He prepares a table in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our head with oil. Surely our cup overflows and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Can I get an amen? amen? See, David understood that he was just a sheep and that the Lord was his shepherd. Enter the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, starting in the first verse. And Jesus tells us about this good shepherd that David followed. Jesus is that good shepherd. Can I get an amen? amen? In the ninth chapter of John, now understand in John, the way he does things, 
is that usually there's a situation or a miracle or something that presents itself. And then John will uh, present that story, but then Jesus will explicate what just happened. He'll kind of explain uh, what just happened. So in the ninth chapter of John, uh, we get this story about a man who's born blind from birth. And Jesus heals the man that's born blind, something that's never been done in the history of the world. We talked about this. We looked deeply at John 9 in our Lenten sermon series. Anybody remember that? About the story about the blind man. Jesus takes his saliva, some mud, puts it on his eyes, restores his sight. And that really just upsets the religious apple cart. Uh, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the scribes, they're in an uproar. The religious folks, they're saying, what are you doing healing a man that was born blind? And they're so caught up, not on the fact that he did this miraculous thing that no one's ever done before, but that he broke their rules. He worked with clay on the Sabbath. And so there's this confrontation that happens. And Jesus calls them out and says, you're spiritually blind. You see, the man was physically blind, but you're spiritually blind. And you're misguiding people. You're a bunch of hypocrites. You're leading people into pits, you see. And so he talks to them about the spiritual blindness. And he says, since you think you can see, you've already condemned yourself. And then right on the tail end of that, the explication of this situation comes in the Gospel of John, in the 10th chapter, starting in the first verse, where we get this uh, figure of speech about Jesus as the good shepherd. Jesus says very truly, amen, amen, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a bandit. Now this would be imagery, this would be a, a, a metaphor that everybody in there should be able to understand. This is simple stuff. You know, the nation of Israel was very familiar with sheep and shepherds. Kind of, they were the mainstay of their society. Sheep were used, they were trimmed, their wool was used to make clothes. Sheep were used kind of like cattle, they were eaten, they were consumed. Sheep were used in the sacrificial system of the temple, especially lambs, were sacrificed for the propitiation of sins. And so everybody standing around should know the story, should understand what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about a sheep pen. A good shepherd would lead their sheep into this pen. And that pen would be maybe a cave or a stone wall or some kind of fencing. They would lead the sheep in. And so if anybody's coming over in the side fence or through the backyard, they're coming with ill intentions, right? They're coming to steal the sheep or they're coming to, to, to do something uh, they're not even authorized to be doing. And so he says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The shepherd goes in, the shepherd comes out, and the shepherd leads the sheep where they're supposed to go. The one who, uh, the gatekeeper, opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. There's this amazing thing about sheep. They have this powerful ability to know the voice of their shepherd. In fact, a, a sheep, sheep know their shepherd's voice so well, they can pick it out in a crowd. Of, of other shepherds. That they, they can know that place. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. See, good shepherds in the ancient world named each one of their sheep. They knew their sheep. They knew the characteristics of their sheep. They knew the ones that like to bite other people. Any of those in there? They knew the ones that like to make a mess. They knew the ones that like to stray off and try to get away from the flock. Shepherds knew their sheep and they had named each one of their sheep. And so a good shepherd knows a sheep and a sheep know him. There's this intimacy. There's this relationship. There's this symbiotic relationship that the sheep are entirely dependent on the shepherd to live and have existence. And when he's brought out all of his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow them because they know his voice. A good shepherd leads the sheep, knows where he's going, and the sheep follow the shepherd because they trust the shepherd and there's this intimacy, there's a relationship. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. This is kind of true of sheep and children. If they don't know you and you come trying to tell them to go somewhere and do something, they're going to look at you like you're crazy or maybe run the other way. Like an amen. Jesus said, these, these sheep that don't know, these, they're not going to follow somebody they don't know. And Jesus used this figure of speech. The Greek word there is paramia. It's not a parable. Jesus doesn't use parables in the Gospel of John. But it's a figure of speech. It's a metaphor, a simile a kind of device. He says, he uses this, but they don't understand what he's saying to them. Now, obviously, what Jesus is doing is confronting the religious establishment. He's talking about their spiritual blindness. And even though this is a very simple little story, very simple illustration, they don't seem to get it because they're spiritually blind. And so Jesus says to them again, very truly, amen, amen, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. 
Now here's the awesome, powerful thing about shepherds in the ancient world. Shepherds literally became the gate for their sheep. They would count each sheep as they would come in at night. They would care for that sheep. If the sheep was injured, they'd put oil on the sheep for healing. If they needed water or fruit or, or trimming or any of those things, they'd bring the sheep into the flock and they'd bring the sheep out. And at night, what shepherds would do, there's only one way in and one way out of the sheep pen. They would literally lay down in the opening of the sheep pen and they would become the gate. If you wanted to get to the sheep, you had to get to the shepherd. And if the sheep wanted to try to escape and get out, they had to go through the shepherd. The shepherd literally became the gate. Y'all get that so far? Yes. He literally becomes the gate. Jesus says, I am the gate. Now, when Jesus says, I am something, we, we should probably pay attention. Can I get an amen? amen? There are several statements in the Gospel of John where Jesus clearly says, I am. I am the way, the truth. I am the gate. I am the gatekeeper. I am uh, 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 the good shepherd. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. Obviously, who he's talking about is the religious establishment uh, that are bandits and thieves and trying to mislead people and they've got their own purposes uh, tied up in this thing. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. Here's the thing about Jesus Christ as the gate, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus is the gate to eternal life. Amen. Jesus, the body of Jesus Christ, His life and His death and His resurrection, through Him, all the gates of heaven have been thrown open. That all people, slaves, Scythian, Jew, free, people that got light skin, people that got dark skin, people that are poor, marginalized, alcoholics, drunks, crack addicts, people that are bankers and lawyers, people that are presidents and judges, all people through the gate of Jesus Christ, the gate of heaven has been thrown open. Can I get an amen? amen. When he's crucified on that cross, the veil is torn, the ground shakes, symbolic of the fact that you don't need a priest. You don't need a middleman. You don't need a Pharisee to get to God. That through Jesus, He's the gate of eternal life. That all people can enter in to relationship with God through Jesus. He says, you see, whoever enters by me will have salvation. He's the gate into this community, into this colony. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I came that you might have life and that you might have life abundantly. And unfortunately, what we do with this text is we make this a heaven thing. We make this that, yes, when we die one day, Jesus is going to be the gate. And we're going to go to this place where we're going to sit around on clouds and play harps and ride rainbow ponies. That's not the truth that Jesus is speaking. He's saying, I'm the gate, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the light, right here, right now. That through your relationship with Jesus, you can have the life of heaven right now. You can have eternal life. You can have a kingdom kind of life that's abundant. Now, prosperity preachers love this text because they can, they can take it and they can say, yes, God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. God wants you to walk around and drive Bentleys and wear $2,000 suits and fly in Learjets. That's not the abundant life that Jesus is talking about. It's not an abundant life that's talking about money and finances and what job you have. It's an abundant life that you have the power of God in your life. That you have love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. It's an abundant life that's connected to the life of Jesus Christ. It's a life that's entirely dependent and contingent on our relationship with Christ. That we can have the eternal kind of life right here, right now. It's the life of new creation that transforms everybody who comes, comes in contact with it. Jesus is that gate. Can I get an amen? amen? Jesus said, you see, the hired hands, they're not the shepherds. They run away. When the wolves come, the hired hand kicks rocks. The hired hand says, I'm not going to lay down my life and die for these sheep. I'm out of here. But Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. Now, unfortunately, what we do with this text is we try to make pastors the good shepherd. But that's not what Jesus says, is it? He says there'll be one flock and one shepherd. He's the good shepherd. He's the living shepherd. He's not a dead God. He's a living God. He's an ascendant and uh, sitting on the throne of heaven, Lord, who by the power of the Holy Spirit is present with His people. He's the person, He's the being that says, where two or more are gathered in my name, there He is in the midst. See, the pastor's not the center of the community. The pastor's not the shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd. Can I get an amen? And everybody in the colony, everybody in this new kingdom, this new creation, is His sheep. We're His followers. Now, inevitably, as we follow Jesus, we become shepherds, right? But that's the job of everybody, not just one. 
Ministry is not about one person getting paid to do it and everybody else receiving it. Not the way Jesus lays it out. He's the good shepherd and we're all the sheep. Jesus says, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, that's the kind of relationship that I want to share with you as the sheep. There's this intimacy, this relationship that we share with Jesus that's entirely dependent. Uh, our, our eternal life now is dependent on Him. And here's the really cool thing. Jesus, as the gatekeeper, is not the kind of gatekeeper that says, these can come in and these can't because of how you look on the outside. But he's the gatekeeper who's flown open the door of heaven from all who will come in and desire a relationship with him. Here's the truth. Jesus dances with wolves, too. And he can domesticate them. I thought somebody would give me an amen on that. <laughs> I mean, what is Paul the Apostle? Ronnie, can you hit the air? What is Paul the Apostle if he's not a wolf? I mean, he's a guy who's out there running down, hunting down Christians and bringing them in to be killed and persecuted, right? I mean, Paul was a wolf, ladies and gentlemen. But when Paul encounters Jesus Christ, he becomes a different kind of wolf. Or as my mentor says, if you want to know how to catch a rabbit, Walter Edwards, uh, just find a hound dog with some hair in his teeth. <laughs> See, Jesus takes wolves and transforms us into different kind of wolves. Wolves that will go out into a dark world and that will drag the broken and the lost and the marginalized back into the flock. Jesus trans transforms lions into different kind of lions. Lions that will stand boldly for the faith and lay down their lives. Jesus transforms sheep into different kind of sheep. And Jesus transforms wolves into different kind of wolves. And the new creation that's unfolding currently, right here, right now, not something that we're just waiting for one day, by and by, high in the sky, God. The new creation that's unfolding right now is the kind of creation where lion and lamb lay down together. It's the kind of creation where wolves and sheep lay down together. It's the kind of creation where the predator-prey distinction has been broken down and all things have been renewed and resurrected into the image of God that God created us to be. We are becoming different kinds of human beings. It's called Christians, little Christ, that are no longer what we used to be, but we've been made new. Can I get an amen? amen. But Jesus says he won't allow them for you. His wolves and sheep's clothing. People that come into the community under false pretenses to prey upon others. People that come into the colony. I got a slide on there, Al. People who come into the community to prey on others who don't come in authentically, but pretend to be something that they're not. And it's exactly those wolves, the Pharisees, that Jesus is confronting in the text. Ladies and gentlemen, at very best, we as human beings fall into the seriously God category. We've got some inconsistencies, we've got some issues, but the good news is we have a good shepherd. And then our life together, thank you for that amen, as a community, our life together as a community is entirely dependent on our relationship with Christ. He's the way in, He's the truth, He's the life, amen. He's the one that grooms us. He's the one that trims our fur. He's the one that loves us. He's the one that feeds us and nurtures us. He's the one that takes us in and out of the pasture. He's the good shepherd who leads us beside the still waters, the green pastures. He restoreth our soul and leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And we, you and I, are the colony of heaven right here on the earth. But here's the truth, folks. We can't spend all our time in the sheep pen. What happens here at church on Sundays and Wednesdays in the Bible study, those are important. They're powerful. We need that in our life. But we follow a good shepherd that leads us out of the sheep pen into a world that's like a valley of wolves. He leads us into that world that's fallen and marred and broken. So that we can go forth as a community that testifies to a new creation. We can go forth and testify to a God who dances with wolves. We can go forth and testify about a God who takes sheep and makes them different kind of sheep. That takes people and makes us different kind of people. That we in Christ have become new creation. But we've got to follow our shepherd out there to the world to proclaim that message. We've got to go outside of the sheep then and proclaim what we learned in here 
out there. Can I get it in? Amen. Amen.